So thank you everyone for watching another video. Um, and this is going to be uh, quite topical because tomorrow we have the election. Uh, and uh, the outcome looks so... My understanding is that the majority of people have already voted. Um, there's mail voting here. Uh, and so the polls... I mean, there isn't too much time for, I mean, the polls could be wrong, but there isn't too much time for the polls to be, uh, to, to, to change, if that makes sense. So it looks like red, green, and then probably with FDP, if the left of SPD has their way, then it's going to be with D-Linka, but there are still a lot of problems with D-Linka. They're starting to behave, but it's unclear. Uh, what's going to happen? Most likely, I'm guessing there's going to be some kind of Espada Green trying to play D-Link and have to be against each other. Um, but we will see. Um, and so, so most likely, we're talking about what SPD is going to do and how the Greens can influence that. Um, and specifically, what just what's going to happen, especially with infrastructure. So one of the problems um, that we have in Germany is that we do not have in urbanism and transportation, both of which are enormous topics in municipal elections, uh, we do not have EMB politics. So when I think of EMB, EMB means yes in my backyard, which is a very generic term, but what it specifically and politically means in the United States, in Britain, and in the Nordic countries, um, which are the places that I know of with active EMBism, I guess maybe also Israel at this point, um, is construction of more housing in uh, city centers uh, paired with some kind of orientation toward public transportation infrastructure. Um, so I would not consider what, let's call it the 1950s, the, the kind of post-war consensus of cars and trains urbanism to be EMB, back when the idea was that you would uh, level a bunch of, so in the United States especially, you may have seen the parking crater um, pics on, on Twitter where the uh, where there are things that looked like the sort of city centers that we are used to here in Europe, and then they knocked down maybe 80% of the buildings to build parking so that people could drive through the remaining 20%. Um, and that was considered infrastructure, parking, and these buildings that they knocked down individually were not very high value. Uh, and so, so that plus maybe a few commuter trains uh, and uh, lots of highways, I don't think of that as EMB. I think of that as kind of keeping, escaping to farther and farther out suburbs, which can mean you're building a lot of housing. In post-war American, post-war Europe built a lot of housing. But usually when I think of EMB, um, like nobody at EMB is talking about building more single-family houses 100 kilometers from city center. Um, and in America, where there are people who think that that is synonymous with development, this has led to certain conflict with developers who are used to building single-family houses 100 kilometers from city center. Um, so when I think of the NBA, I think of the politics of building more housing, um, where there's most demand for it, which is in city center. Um, I, I, I keep flooring Germans by telling them how much I pay in rent because the, the rent that I'm paying in Meta is ungodly cheap whenever I talk to an American in a major city and ungodly expensive whenever I talk to a German. So the idea of building more housing in Berlin inside the ring, um, but also pair it with green infrastructure, that is, not a, that is not a thing that exists in German politics, unfortunately, except maybe Kevin Kuhnert, who thinks that it's all going to be public housing. Um, so if you look at the SPD politics on this, SPD is absolutely for building more housing. Um, Usos, in fact, in Berlin, uh, and again, it's Kevin Kiernaut mostly, um, declared themselves to be EMB, and they're very left EMB, so they also believe in uh, confiscating, in something called uh, Deutsche Wohnen Enteignen. It's a referendum that's going to be, that's going to happen tomorrow about conf uh, that declares the city's intent to confiscate um, I believe 229,000 apartments belonging to large commercial landlords, not to the small ones that just squat on housing and build nothing, only to the big ones that sometimes also build new buildings. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, with compensation far below market value because 
market rate for all of these combined would be 30 something billion euros. They said it does not have that money. Um, so proponents of the uh, proposal of, of Deutsche Wohn and Antagonin say it would cost six to nine billion because they can compensate below market value, except they can't compensate that far below market value. So we're still talking about 30 something billion. Uh, and uh, so, so SPD is against that. Like, I don't mean, I don't mean Kevin Kuhnhout is about the most left-wing person you can get within SPD. Um, but SPD, the party, is against that and for building more housing, which you think is maybe EMB. Um, the, they talk about building, uh, I believe, 14,000 new units uh, in Tempelhof. So in Berlin, uh, as in the rest of Europe, we do not replace small buildings with big ones. So you can see on a map, and I and even have a video on this, so not the one that I'm hovering over, which is a video about um, U and S-Bahn uh, expansion that I think is necessary for the city, but rather the next one, which is about redevelopment in Berlin. So European Yimbyism is never about taking something like this. So this is von Holman Schatze, so outside but right next to the ring. Um, still on a trunk line, so uh, there's going to be a train from here to city center every three minutes, 20 seconds, all day. And taking these and, and looking at these houses with gardens, which are, I'm pretty sure, individually owned. So these people are not getting confiscated by Deutsche Wohnen and Antigenen. Um It's the people who build big buildings who get confiscated. Um, so the so there's no sense of even permitting any kind of upzoning here so that a an owner here can sell to a developer and turn a house with a garden into something that looks like these buildings. That's just not under the radar anywhere in Europe. Um, maybe in London, I'm not sure. Um, but also London is a rather nimby city. Um, so in in, the, in Europe, when we say EMB, we mean find empty land. So this is empty land. It is used as a park, but it's not a very good park. Um, it's former airport, so... Uh, uh, no trees, for example, so there's no shade cover, uh, and uh, you can, I say you can, but I, I don't think uh, Felix Toma is here. Felix Toma will verify to you that crossing the, this park um, at a leisurely pace on one hot summer day, I had to go through two one and a half liters of water just to avoid sunstroke. Um, so they were talking about building some buildings here, and even this, you can see, it's like it's maybe it's not the greatest location for cars. Maybe if you build an infill station here, but it's not. But none of the radials hit this. I mean, you, if you want to be truly MB, you will find land closer to the subway. So, um, so that's Espada. So, um, so they want to build more urban housing, maybe, but. They're also building this freeway. So you might say that this is an under construction freeway. The city has been run by SPD for 20 years. This is an SPD project. They um, went into coalition with CDU, um a couple terms ago because the Greens would because the Greens were just against this. Um, so things like not doing this anymore. And by the way, you might wonder about the characteristics of this neighborhood. This is the poorest neighborhood. This is the poorest urban inner urban neighborhood. So obviously, this is a neighborhood that gets split by a freeway. Um, and uh, the um, Greens are against all of that. The Greens, but, um, so you think, oh, the Greens are for green infrastructure. No, they're not. The Greens think that everyone should ride a bike or a tram. They think that um, Ubans are kind of immoral. There's this kind of generational trauma of German Greens and general German urbanists that um, view Ubans as a post-war conspiracy almost by the auto industry. Remember I talked about the cars and trains urbanism earlier of the 1950s? So what we did here is we absolutely did not convert city centers into parking craters. This was an American special, but in a randomly selected city like Hanulfo, so medium-sized city, um, there were lots and lots of trams going anywhere. Um, something that you can see later, I'm going to show it to you on just doing through Google Earth throws them in Leipzig because the East never did that. The, the, the East kept the trams. Um, and what they did in the West is they removed most of the trams, but they replaced the centermost segments with subways, um, which uh, split into different uh, branches on the surface. If you're American, this is exactly the 
Muni Metro in San Francisco or the subway surface trolley in Philadelphia or the Green Line in Boston. And uh, this is... And this is the post that I have written on it. So because of that history, um, there's this kind of generational trauma. And as a result, a lot of public transport activists in Germany don't like U-Bahns very much. So the people who like U-Bahns are maybe not EMBs, but people who also think cars are nasty and think that um, that, that a um, street like Karl Marx slash Frankfurt Halle is absolutely fine as a street with something like six um, with something like six lanes of traffic in the middle of the city, um, and uh, and uh, that uh, and, and so if you want to vote for maybe not having giant semi freeways in the middle of the city like this, you kind of have to vote green. Except the greens are NIMBY. So there's no, this is what I'm saying when I'm saying that there's no EMB politics in Germany, unfortunately. Um, in fact, it's been a hard decision who to vote for. Um, in the state, and it kept going back and forth between SPD, which again is maybe more pro housing, but also more pro car, um, and their mural candidate, Francisco Gifai, is a terrible person. She faked her degree. She, she plagiarized her degree, her degree got revoked. She does not have the shame to resign and leave politics. She had to resign from her ministerial post, her federal ministerial post but she remains important in the party. Um, she remains their mayoral candidate, which I suspect is, uh, is about racism. Um, SPD in Berlin has this really strong politician named Raid Saleh. Wait, Pittsburgh has subway surface? I thought the subway surface was BRT in Pittsburgh. So, um, but, um, but anyway, um, in, um, so, so Francisco Gifai, has this plagiarism scandal. Um, again, she's not running away from it. She's um, acting like nothing's wrong. Uh, and meanwhile, the Green leader, Annalena Baerbock, is not going to be the next chancellor because of a fake plagiarism scandal. She plagiarized nothing, but um, her master's degree is from Britain. She says she has a master's degree, and apparently because his master's degree is not from Germany, um, the right-wing media is part of kind of a CDU campaign to go negative back when the Greens were leading in the polls in April. Um, they kept saying that she faked her degree, which is a thing that happens all the time in, in Germany. The ger uh, degrees here are prestigious, so people fake them. Baerbock did no such thing, but um, Bild and Die Welt would like you to believe that she, she did do something wrong. And um, Espada is shameless about this. Um, and again, it's a, it's a racist thing because Francisco Gifai is a white person. I mean, she's a woman, she's an Easterner. Both of these count for something in political affirmative action. On the other hand, our outgoing chancellor is an Eastern woman. And uh, the person that Espada is keeping Francisco Gifai, I think, to avoid nominating as a mayor, who's again, a really strong candidate, that's Raid Saleh. Um, and Raid Saleh, his name is Raid Saleh. He is 1.5th generation Palestinian German. Um, like all Germans, he um, can't speak for like a, for like five sentences without saying that he hates anti-Semitism. Um, that's not an Arab overcompensation, it's a German thing. Um, again, very good on, uh, on a bunch of different uh, urban issues within uh, Berlin, but again, his name is Raed Saleh. Um, he's been floated as a potential SPD mayoral candidate going back years, and there's always a mediocre white person like Michael Müller or now Francisco Giffey, uh who's ahead of him, and I think it's important to punish that. Um, so it's not like I like voting green for the Abgar Mountain House because of the NPSM, but at this point I feel compelled to. And um, I will say that from the Buddhist stock, I don't mind. Um, now the Greens, so here's the thing, because the Green NBSM federally does have certain impact on infrastructure, um, but it's not really a matter of cancellation of good things. It's more a matter of wanting more fuel taxes and wanting more general priority for rail and less for road, both of which are good things. 
Oh, in Pittsburgh, BRT is, I think, going east, not west, but I don't remember. Um, at any rate, so about the greens and infrastructure. We have a giant NIMBY problem in Germany. Um, and um, in Germany, the issue is similar vaguely to the United States in that there are groups that enjoy suing the government, and usually the government just falls. Um, and it's not because the government is weak. It's like in America. In America, the government can do whatever it wants, and this is also true in Germany. Um, the problem is that uh, this looks politically controversial. And, is, and as always, when you have people who exercise informal power, they're always going to be people who are like representing the past and not the future. Um, why? Because the past has had more time to insinuate itself into tradition than the future. So um, when you're trying to confiscate land from the confiscated, confiscate of land, um, apartments belong to Deutsche Wohnen, and that's maybe the future because they're recent realty. Um, it's, not, it's not like a, a traditional thing in Germany, it's just a, a recent realty that's been aggressively buying apartments and also developing, mostly buying, not developing, I will say. Um, but if it's a, but if it's, let's say, a community that has a long tradition, these can be people are as privileged as the shareholders as Deutsche Wohnen, they might own shares in Deutsche Wohnen. Um, but suddenly you want to take their houses and pay market prices and it's considered somehow immoral. And again, it's more urban, it's not more urban, it's more rural than urban because again, more time to have been, to have insinuated itself into German tradition. Um, so more small city than big city. When the city is more people with a Keats identity than an urban identity. And it's kind of funny how people talk about, oh, the Keats and it's people who, and it's people who maybe have bought into that system and it's people who, um, very clearly have zero Keats identity. The identity is Berlin within the ring. They talk about, oh, yeah, between any two points within the ring, it takes half an hour to travel with um, access time to the U-Bahn or the S-Bahn and changing time and maybe wait time. It's uh, This is kind of the stereotype. And the same person who explained literally that to me also talked to me about the importance of the Keats. And... Um, and it's not somewhere... And, and they think it... And, and I don't even think these are native Berliners. So it's... Kind of like the idea that um, a city of neighborhood is more moral, and it's very rarely reality. Um, people don't usually work exactly where they live. Um, I do not know the numbers in Berlin, so I'm going to tell you uh, what the um, numbers for New York are, because I have in in New York the, uh, the data for uh, using uh, on the map. So... This is an American tool. I wish I had comparable German or French data just to do the comparison because the best I have is the is job counts by uh, by municipality um, or in, in Paris by arrondissement, which is not granular enough for me. Um, and um, at any rate, this is the number to look at. It's not an Excel. It's a, um, this is the proportion of people in various community boards of New York with, um, who work in the same community board that they live in. Literally, the only high number is Midtown Manhattan because you only live there if you want a walking commute. Um, and even then, it's less than half. Um, normally, it's single digits. So, it's again, so it's the idea that the Keats matters more than a pan city identity, that rural more than urban, industries of the past more than industries of the future, old people more than young people, white people more than, I want to say people of color, but we do not have communities of color in Germany, my colony is maybe 50-50, so let's call them diverse communities, which is unfortunately also the German euphemism. Um, people say diverse community about my colony, while also saying that it's an enclave, which again, it's a neighborhood that's about half either Germans without migration background or people with European migration background. Um, but again, it's a diverse community. I mean, half of them are people of color. Germany is on 50% people of color. It's maybe 10% people of color. Um, I want to say straight more than um, more than queer, but also queer people are not a place-based community in any way, shape, or form. Um, 
and and I say this socializing with Berlin queers extensively, I know where where we go, I know where we live. I mean, so yes, it's mostly it's maybe more in the ring than outside the ring because maybe a lot of us came to the city from elsewhere. Um, but subject to that, I don't think we're any different from the mostly straight people that I meet at gaming. It's, it's kind of the same thing. One person once in a while lives in the western parts of the city because the because Charlottenburg is expensive, so you don't live there unless you're from there. Um, and so it's mostly within the ring U6 to, to the east. So that's maybe not a very place-based community, but in everything else, it's like a reproduction of social hierarchy um, that someone who probably in their 50s or 60s, um, this being Germany, probably has some kind of engineering degree and thinks it is relevant to modern high-speed rail construction, something that Germany has, for all intents and purposes, never done because the um, cutting edge of how you do high-speed rail construction is not here. Germany is good at other things, not the construction. Um, and um, so th so th um, these people uh, who if they write a report, which they can, because again, usually old or retired um, engineers uh, who say that something is not necessary and because they are German, obviously what they say has weight. And if I say the same thing, but maybe in a different direction, first of all, maybe I'm not representing some kind of tradition. I'm not from here. I am a boomer, but I'm a millennial boomer, not a boomer boomer. Um, so there, so the state listens to them, which again, it does not have to. This is all informal power. Um, um, so the, uh, so there was this lawsuit against uh, Elon Musk. He wanted to build, he still wants to build a gigafactory in Brandenburg, and uh, a Bavarian, so not local Bavarian, uh, eco-fascist organization sued because they don't like that it's going to employ Polish workers and. Um, they lost the lawsuit. I think it was a one-year delay. So, uh, and, and likewise, big companies that actually just build things can do things over local objections. Amazon is in the process of building an office tower in Friedrichstein. Um, same thing. Um, there was, I, I don't know if there was a big lawsuit, but I know there was a lot of political opposition, lots of posters, no Amazon tower, but Amazon is not subject to NIMBY vote. And, so all of this is informal power, and yes, these are people who probably vote green more than SPD, but my guess is that these people mostly vote Tede. Um And who gets elected it doesn't isn't going to matter very much because it's not like there's in the same way that there's no name. Sorry, I, I want to say there's no name because everyone is false. In the same way that there's no Yembi politics in Germany, there is no um, there's no sense that Germany needs to be more like other countries. Um, and even in things where it's very obvious that it needs to be more like other countries, I haven't looked at Taiwan's um, infection rate today. Let me look now. This is so sad that it's Paraguay, Belize, and some kids in Aves and not, let's say, the US and all NATO allies. Taiwan reported five new COVID-19 cases, all of which were contracted overseas. Yeah, uh, lately, Taiwan has not yet suppressed corona completely, but it... Okay, you don't have the graph here. Just believe me or look at Focus Taiwan.tw and look through their archives. Uh, last couple weeks, maybe, Taiwan is basically hovering between zero, one, and two new corona cases a day. Germany, on the other hand, so we are starting to bend the curve on Delta, but this number is a lot of things, but two per day it isn't. So the idea that maybe Germany should be learning from Taiwan on this or South Korea, that's just not a thing, unfortunately. Um, I haven't seen anyone openly call for mandatory vaccination on the French model, or if they have, they have not said, let's be like Macron, because the idea is that Macron is bad, even when France is visibly succeeding at something better than Germany. Uh, and yeah, we are better at learning from the rest of Europe, but we're not good at learning from the rest of Europe. 
So this is what's going on with the vaccination rates. Share of people vaccinated. Germany. So the US is currently the worst in the G7, but we're second worst. Um, on, and I'm doing this on first uh, dose and not second dose just because um, that kind of registers intent to vaccinate. So then Japan, France at 74, Italy at 70. Southern Europe is doing really well on this, but nobody here ever thinks that you have anything to learn from Southern Europe, especially not the people who vacation in Southern Europe because then they go to Alicante and think everyone else, I mean, they see everyone else being on vacation and think, oh yeah, it's Spain. Everyone there is either on vacation or serving me food. They clearly are not engineers. Um, and meanwhile, Spain, Portugal, Germany. So the point is that doing better on high-speed rail because it's so coded as French in Germany is something that's really difficult to do just because it doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, in, when we were in the 1990s and we had eurosclerosis and Pedro ran a campaign against Shredder complaining that Germany had the lowest economic growth rate in Europe, which was for a couple of years actually true. Um, they were not saying, oh, Spain at the time viewed as new Europe, not as Rumsfeld's old Europe, uh, not as today when we say pigs or European core versus periphery. Now, back then, what's called the core was old Europe and what's called the periphery was called new Europe um, and had higher economic growth before the financial crisis. Um, Back then, when I said, oh, let's be like, quote, unquote, New Europe, they didn't say, oh, New Europe built a lot of subways. Look at how much uh, Madrid is building. No, it was not about that. It was always about cutting taxes or, or doing things that are kind of like going to affirm these informal, um, mostly old, almost entirely white, um, kind of more trad elites in Germany. And this is not something that electing red green is going to help, unfortunately. Um, it's something that requires like a cultural change in Germany and it requires a civil service that understands that a degree from Britain is a degree, for example. Um, I mean, literally, we're not we're about to not have Baerbock as chancellor because um, because right wing me. I, I don't want to call them right wing media. Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung is right wing now. Um, the Axel Springer papers are felt in build they're just state they're just let's call them state media when said it was in charge and like party media when said it was in opposition it's a lot it's a lot like fox news at this point or, or um the daily mail and so um the so, so, but i mean they work with the ingredients that they have and the ingredients that they had was a degree what was a master's degree from i believe long I think it was the London School of Economics, so a place that's probably harder to get into than most German unis. Um, yeah, masters from LSE. Um. Anyway, so. The point is because there's this kind of German insularity. Um, it's not quite as bad as I think when Sweden literally does not think that there's anything to learn from a country other than Sweden or maybe Norway, but it's a lot more insular than, for example, Southern Europe. And the outcome is that it's going to be very hard to, to learn. And you can say that, and the same way with the United States, when, whenever they drift in a negative direction, they just don't, they can't course correct, um, because they, because it interferes with the American pride of being better than other countries. And so, you look at these plans, um, I'm going to share the link here. Um, so these are plans for additional investment in rail in Germany, and the costs here are horrific. So for example, let's do things like, uh, so this is Aschaffenburg to Würzburg, Hanau to Aschaffenburg. Um, so if you do not know what Aschaffenburg is, it is a... Bavarian, it's a small Bavarian city that is so close to, uh, that is so close to Hesse that it's almost like a suburb of Frankfurt at this point. So this is Aschaffenburg. Um, 
I don't think they have. Let me let me actually check. I don't remember if they. I don't think they have front protect one. No, no, they don't. Um, but it's but yeah, like you know, Alban, they will take you to Hanau and Frankfurt. So there are these plans for high speed rail to Frankfurt. Um, and it's not going to go all the way to city center. Um, so the trains are going to go at low speed on this line. Um, I think there are plans. I actually check. I don't remember if this list of projects includes through tracks in Frankfurt, which is a uh, terminal station. So you have to go flip, flip if you want to run through, which you should want to run through. It's in the middle of the country. It's not Munich or Hamburg. Um, and, um, and it gets to the point that uh, a lot of through trains, uh, not most, but some, but, but a fair bit of through trains, don't do, let's say, Köln, Frankfurt, and then back out. They do Köln, skip Frankfurt, and only serve it at the airport. Um, and so through trucks in Frankfurt, at Frankfurt would be really useful. Again, I forget if they're on the list, we will see in a sec. Um, but the things that are not urban, or even metropolitan, so, for example, so again, so Frankfurt Hanau is left for later, which I think is not a good idea. Um, it's, I mean, leaving 20 kilometers for later is okay. I mean, France did it with the original LGFS Sudest, um, until, so the LGFS Sudest in France, um, was built in stages, um, in which technically the first stage was two thirds of the line from, let me see if I can find it. Um, so from here, from Saint Florent, from Saint Florentin to Lyon, so that's about two thirds. So this is about a third of the way. Um, but within, I believe, two years, they opened the rest. So mostly it was. So I believe the trains. This is not no. Th so this is yeah. So it started here. So it started with them going about twenty-ish or thirty kilometers on existing track. Uh, then transitioning, and then they built a little closer to city center when at the same in the 90s, so about 10 years later, when they opened this bypass around the city. They also used the bypass to get closer, like this. So um, this is something that I can understand. I mean, I think that it's a higher priority just because high speed rail in Germany is such a high investment priority. They've invested in everything else, basically, in city except for electrification. But, um, but, but, but everything else that they're doing in the talk is, I don't want to say hitting the point of diminishing return, but might actually hit the point of diminishing return at this point without um, actually good connections between the largest cities. Again, I, I talk about the tradition. The tradition is not just NIMBY, it's also about investment priorities. So when someone thinks that it is somehow less moral to invest in trains between Berlin and Frankfurt actually being fast than in squeezing some extra ridership out of, I don't even know what town because there's so many random places with 40,000 people that think they're more moral than Berlin. Um, Koblenz or something, or, um, or I think Limburg managed to con its way, yeah, Limburg managed to con its way into getting a station on a high-speed rail bypass. Um, the station connects to nothing, as you can see. Um, it's just so that people can drive to the station and get to Frankfurt and go faster. It's not a large city. Um, but there's going to be a lot of Limburg, so there should be some kind of... No, not region. The former chief town of, yeah, they, they had to, ch it's not even a real town. It's a, they had to change the name because it's not even a, okay, I'm not going to do the Britannica thing. Thank you very much. Yeah, 30,000 30, people live there. Yeah, no, I mean, so, um, th so because there's this idea that it's somehow more moral to squeeze more ridership out of places like this than to, enable better high-speed rail to places where you don't need to do these random subsidies and so just build things that will make money. So that would be things like Berlin, Frankfurt, or faster trains. Berlin, I said Berlin to Frankfurt, Berlin to Frankfurt, or Berlin to Munich is only half-built. 
Um, and it's probably going to be cheaper to complete than it was to build what they've done so far because they've built across the mountains. Um, we're compiling Berlin Munich, doing Berlin Köln, and of course the other rural towns. Um, Frankfurt, Stuttgart, which actually is going to get built. Um, Stuttgart, München, they're a little bit too slow with this, I think, but it's sort of happening. Uh, and and Wilsburg, Frankfurt for Frankfurt Munich, which is being done. Remember, we're talking about a fashion book. This is, so you do Frankfurt, so Hanau is almost Frankfurt. So Hanau to, so, this, so these two lines get you to, um, get you between Hanau and uh, Wiltsburg. Uh, and uh, they are uh, talking about uh, also boosting speeds to uh, 230 kilometers an hour. Uh, and um, they're, they're talking about Frankfurt Wiltsburg uh, in a little less than an hour so that um, they can have nice transfers there, um, kind of Swiss model. But this is not 100 kilometers. I mean, might be, maybe a little more because it's not a straight line, but that's... So, so this is something that's not... No, they're reluctant to connect to Berlin. No, it, it's not about uh, post unification. So, on, on the contrary, actually, Berlin's getting a lot of projects specifically because of post unification projects to subsidize the East. So, this is why Berlin Munich is happening. This is why Berlin Hamburg is one of the fastest city pairs in Germany. Um, it's all with tilting trains, Berlin Hamburg, not uh, 300 kilometers an hour trains, but um, the only other connection. Yeah, that's a line that should be a 30 minute connection, not an, hour, not an hourly connection. And this not quite 100 kilometers. So we start from Hanau. To build, uh, it's not going to. I mean, the straight line doesn't pass straight through Aschaffenburg. It's not that big of a deal. This is 81 kilometers. It's going to be maybe a little more um, routed through Aschaffenburg, but um, they're talking about 2. Point something billion, uh, like like 2.2 .2 billion euros. That's high speed rail money. Um, now what else? Um, um, so Dortmund Ham uh, is rather expensive. Dortmund Ham is not a long uh, thing. Dortmund Ham. So Ham is this really annoying city. I've never been there, but there's kind of treated as a knot that is kind of the connection point to the Ruhr because it's the branch point for trains from the east that want to go to either Dortmund slash Essen slash Duisburg or direct Köln, whereas what they should be doing is making Dortmund at that point. So this is 30 kilometers. Um, so what they should be doing is skipping Köln, which is not a larger important city, make the branch point Dortmund. Dortmund, and then, yeah, that means building some tunnels around here, but you're spending that money anyway in Germany. Like, Germany is not, again, Germany is not a low-cost country. And, there's, um, and, and so we talk about the sufficient building because of this idea that the high-speed rail system would not fit Germany being polycentric, except then you ask people to explain polycentricity, and they say, oh, yeah, we have Berlin and Frankfurt and Munich and Hamburg and Stuttgart and Köln, and Essen, and Dortmund, and it's not like everything is in Paris. Well, okay, yeah, high speed connects all these cities. Um, and if you want to talk about small, about places that are, like, let's say, sub-half million regions, we have less of these, I mean, fewer people living in these here than France does. Um, so anyway, this is Dortmund Ham, and kind of expensive. Um, because they want Ham to be the knot. And this is where we're doing things like Ham to Bielefeld and uh, Hannover. And uh, this is with the other thing that I linked to, which is this one. This one. They have these ideas for how to build a new high speed line between Hannover and Bielefeld. Um, if you're wondering why Bielefeld, um, the issue is, so look here. So you might notice that Ham to Bielefeld is rather straight, which is why, uh, so Ham to Bielefeld is rather straight and therefore um, is, so, so, there, so this is the connection they're talking about from Ham to Bielefeld. 
Um, so they can actually speed up the trains there to at least some extent on existing track. Um, because the plan is to do Ham to Hanofel in an hour, um, which I think is not a good target. The target should be Dortmund to Hanofel in an hour, which is a lot more aggressive, but absolutely doable. Um, but the point is that this can be mostly high speed without too much vibe. I think, although, I mean, they're talking about 2 billion euros on this, and this is 63 kilometers, so that's basically, it's not basically, it's I mean, in France, this would literally be no. In France, this is, in France, they would build a high-speed line between these cities on a lower budget, and then you have. But 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 the point is, that it's mostly on existing, and then the thing that's labeled Noi, um, is because you can kind of see that this is a squigglier line, and the cost that is being estimated for this, this is we don't need to use coal for. It's not, let's not do the farming. Um. So if you're wondering, so this is the old line, you can see how curvy it is, and this is the freeway, uh, Bundesautobahn 2. And they have all these variants that are partly new, partly old. Uh, and variant 4, no, variant 5 is the only really high-speed one. Uh, so we're talking 96.4 kilometers. Uh, average speed that doesn't quite do Hannover Bielefeld in less than half an hour or not. Um, the sort of retired engineers in, in Germany who do not know that Japan and France have anything that's worth learning from think that you can't do any better. They're wrong. You actually can't do better if you look at Tiperdia. So, for all Japanese trains. Um, let's Actually, let me, uh, before I do anything, uh, let me turn on the light. I keep forgetting. First time I had to turn on the lights from the start. And uh, then it got to be summer, so I could have lights off throughout. And now I need to have lights on toward the end. So anyway, Hyperdia has... Let's do Kyoto to Nagoya. These are two cities which are much larger than uh, the German cities in question, so harder to build in. Um, Nago so Metro Nagoya would be the largest single core metro region in Germany. I think that Nag Metro Nagoya is also unusually auto-oriented. Um, Borners, if, if you're still here, can you tell me if I'm getting started? My understanding is that Nagoya is because maybe because of Toyota and because of heavy industry, it's kind of a more decentralized and auto-oriented region than than the usual. And, and then Kyoto is a pole and a polycentric thing. And I think that Kyoto share of it is two point something million, so it's Hamburg size. Um and very old. Uh so thirty-four minutes on non-stop trains from Kyoto to Nagoya. Um, they're saying the distance is 147.6. This is a lie. This is the map. So um, one of the annoying things about Hyperdia is that they, on the Shinkansen, they will tell you, so it's an excellent website, but on the Shinkansen, they have an annoying tendency to tell you the old numbers, not the new numbers. The, so this is how long the old main line takes, but this is Shinkansen. It's a straighter and shorter line. So we need to go here and see the correct uh, mileage. Kilometrage. Um, 342. 476. So this is 134.6 kilometers. And it is done in 34 minutes. The maximum speed is not 300. It is 285. Oh, Nagio Kyoto is Okay, Nagio. Okay, right. Because JR Central doesn't care about anything. It's not the Tokaido Shinkansen or the under construction Chuo Shinkansen. Yeah. Um, at any rate, so this is about 100, so this is 134, we said, and it takes 34 minutes on the schedule, not as a best case thing. Now, Germany is telling me that it's going to be only three minutes less to do 96, not 134, 96. 
at a higher maximum speed because the maximum speed we're talking about here is 300. And what they do in uh, Japan is 285. And yeah, this is not a 31. This is done right 27, 28. And if it's 27, 28, congratulations. This is, these are your half hour knots at Hannover and Bielefeld. Um, and now let's talk about the cost. So yeah, they're compromising the schedule. And yet, they're talking about 17.6 kilometers of tunnel. So this is a line that is 17.6 kilometers in tunnel out of 78.4 new line to be constructed. Twenty-two percent. And some bridging, but it's not but it's not Asia. We don't go crazy on the bridge, it's just sixteen percent in Asia. At this point, everything that's not uh everything that's not in tunnel is on a bridge and that's where their costs are high. And and the invest in the investment cost is almost five billion euros. No, I don't want to four eight eight six divided by, let's pretend, 96.4, it's 50 million euros a kilometer. But it's not, because this is also, because that's not the length of the new line. The, the new line is 78.4. The actual cost is this. And this is, remember, euros, not dollars. So if you think in dollars, it's like 85, maybe, million a kilometer. Um, now, yes, there are some tunnels, but even the tunnel length is kind of questionable. Yes, there are hills here. These are not very significant hills. Um, this can be done at grade. This can be done with 3.5 or 4% um, grade to crest small hills, not big ones, but small ones. Um, and yet, they think that it needs to be 22% in tunnel. Even then, 22% in tunnel is not 60 million euros a kilometer normally. It's 40, 45 million euros per kilometer, even that is something, and even that is something you probably want to look into. So, um, a lot of this is just, so, so I'm focusing on this just because it's an example where I can tell you the exact tunnel length, but it's just, it, it's that kind of bullshit. And again, it's not something that you can do better by electing a different government, and it's not something, it's something you can do better by canceling this, because it's not like canceling this will lead to a better project, because what is... What needs to be done specifically is for Germany to understand that it needs to be more like France. Canceling projects will not make Germany understand it needs to be more like France. This is a giant problem. Um, and, um, and it requires many Germans to, to learn how to collaborate and becoming more like France. Um, so this is why it's something that absolutely can't happen and it's somewhat generational. Um, but so, so, so do notice, for example, that for, for younger people, um, practically everyone I meet feels green. And I mean, yes, I'm meeting more urban people, disproportionately queer, and yet the rest of the left exists. I think I've met one person who's voting Dilinka. Um, and maybe a few are voting SPD. Not few, maybe two are voting SPD. I mean, it's all green. And so, it's something people don't really get, um, generational politics, like gener like age as a basis of conflict. Because you have because again, we're talking about all these trad hierarchies and maybe people get that um that maybe race might be a uh, political conflict the, 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 um, um for resources between racists and people who support racial equality. But um Age is something that I means because everyone, for populist reasons, says we'll protect the pensioners, and then they actually waste all of the nation's resources on making the pensioners comfortable while working age people and children get very little. Um, and again, it's not, it's not a German thing. I mean, in the United States, compare Medicare with getting health care is under 65. Um, and so there is actually a generational party here, which is the Greens. Like a, a lot of the Greens, you, you don't understand them as a generational party, um, and um, and and everything just fits in. Except that if you're 
or if you're used to, I don't know, interpreting Marxist scriptures in terms of everything else being um, superstructure, then you will make up reasons why that's not real. Um, and of course, it was likely to have grown up reading Marxist scriptures as if they're relevant. People who have, people who either grew up before 1989 or sufficiently close to it that they still take socialism seriously. Um, and so, um, you know that in the United States, things are so bad that there are young Americans who are, at least to some extent, willing to think how they can be more like other places, like Germany. In Germany, I, I haven't heard this. Like, I haven't heard Germans tell me how, uh, about things that work better literally anywhere else. Um, and this includes nuclear stuff. So there isn't any ground of people here wanting to reactivate the nuclear plants. I mean, they're expensive. There are people who are, who don't, I, I would say the younger greens are not anti-nuclear, just don't care. It's not terribly important. I mean, on the eve of Fukushima, I believe we're 23% nuclear, not 70% like France. So, um, but, but it's not in a, a driving feature. I mean, they, the, the big um, Fighters for Future protest uh, two years ago, I saw one anti-nuclear sign. It was held by two people, of whom one looked retired, the other looked 40. The so median age at the protest, I believe, was probably about 21 or 22. I'm just going to guess. Um, so, the, um, so, so, so the main of this, you don't care about this, but they also are not saying, let's be more like France, let's be more like Switzerland, let's be more like, I mean, I mean Switzerland, maybe it doesn't have high-speed rail, but it has very good rail planning in general, much greener than Germany, while still being an industrial exporter, let's be like Sweden, I mean, I mean you don't hear that, unfortunately. Um, and this is going to be a giant problem, which leads to problems like this, like something that where these 200-ish kilometers from Dortmund to uh, from Dortmund to Hannover, um, which should probably cost four-ish billion euros to build, uh, and instead um, they're going to be slower, and so we're talking. 5.1, 2.1, and 1.3. So, 8.5? Yeah, they're talking about 8.5 billion euros for something that should probably be 4 point something. Um, maybe 4 is aggressive, but 5, normal. Um, actually, let me check this. Is it 200? Um, this is, so, this is, so, so, let's say this is about 99 ish. Yeah, it's probably going to be about the same, especially if you skip home. Yeah, it's probably about 190 of construction. Yeah, it should be 4 point something billion euros. Um, five if you're going nuts on tunnels. So, so this, is a, so this is a huge problem that we have. And again, you can look at more things. Uh, so the big ones, again, are Frankfurt, Wiltsburg, um, um, Hannover, and, and Hannover to what's it called, to Ham. Uh, um, so this is finally they're doing um, Frankfurt to uh, so this is connecting Darmstadt to the system but they're about to do Frankfurt to uh, Mannheim um, which already has two lines which are very busy um, these are some nice things um, so we're talking about Frankfurt full day in 35 minutes, which is, again, a really frustrating thing. This is the cost. It's, it's 2.1. So, again, all of these really start in Hanau, um, which is why it's 35 minutes for something that should be at this distance doable in 30 for nice knots. Um, so this is about 70 kilometers. So at least this is decent. Um, so full day, uh, not full day for, uh, so, um, so, so I will say that Hanau to Fulda, um, is pretty good. Um, and, and then you got to things like Fulda Airport, 
Where where are they staying here for the air fort? Um, they're not actually telling me in the air fort. They're telling me Eisenhower. But also the cost are the same thing. It's five billion, and I mean yes, there are mountains here. Um, but I'm pretty sure they're doing so many compromises they can just bypass the mountain. This is a hundred. It absolutely needs tunnels. Um, with these tunnels, it's probably going to be about five billion. But it, which is this? Except they're talking about not going direct to Erfurt for maximum speed, but through Eisenach. Um, so that's less tunneling. You see, the mountains here are less thick. And also, they're talking about doing um, Fulda Eisenach in 43 minutes, which is a very uh, unim unimaginative speed, like an average speed of 90 kilometers an hour or something like that. And yeah, you're going to be faster to airport, but still, that's very ambitious. So you have very ambitious spending and not very ambitious results. It's very American this way. Um, Wilsburg, Nuremberg, here they're finally doing a good thing, which is 29 minutes between them, between the cities. So they're making an effort to make it a nice knot. Nuremberg, Wilsburg. And you can kind of see it's also it's a high average speed. It's a little more than 90 kilometers. Um, so it's going to be an average speed scratching 200 kilometers an hour. And fortunately, 5.7 billion euros, which is, again, yeah, it's, it's all these really bad numbers. If it's like 92 kilometers, it's 62 million per kilometer. What the hell are you doing that it's 62 million per kilometer? Look at the terrain. I mean, not the world's easiest, but I mean, also not the world's hardest. Um, this is kind of annoying, but um, this, you can, this is okay. This is not that terrible. It's this kind of, it's like, going to be lots of fell. Um, and tunnel or tunnel until so it's easy. Um, here, okay, you have a tunnel, and then here. I mean, I mean this is not that hard. Um, it, that should not be 5.7. Um, Knot in Mannheim. Okay. Um, Berlin Halle, which here's their understanding. What they should be doing is uh, making this a high speed line. Um, it's going to be expensive, but not really expensive, not compared with what they're spending on all of these because it's not going to have tunnels. And um, the um, so, so it's not going to have tunnels, but also, um, by the way, if you're seeing weird things that look like terrain, that's not terrain. All, all of this is like, it's called the North German plain. There, there's literally no terrain here. Um, Berlin has like two hills, Kreuzberg, and Prenzlauer uh, back, like iceberg. I guess. Um, but even there, not really hills. It's, so you just go direct. You do not need any tunnels. You do what to. You probably don't care about Halle that much. You want to go to Leipzig. You go also to Halle. But really, the important thing is to get to the high speed line that is not currently depicted because Google Earth, either my version of it hasn't been updated or they haven't updated, but um, Google Earth. Um, kind of depicts the the rail network of a few years ago, and um, Berlin Munich opened in, um, I believe it opened 2016. Um, so all of these things that opened 2015, 2016, 2017, maybe aren't, or, or even more recently are not depicted. Um, the, so for example, the Second Avenue subway in New York is not depicted. That opened end of 2016, I believe. Um, and um, what else? Um, um, so in Berlin, actually, we can check something new. Um, in Berlin, U5 opened last year. And it's not affected. So Brandenburg at all. And here there should be a session. They still give it the older name, uh, Französische. Französische. Uh, Französische. Französische Straße, instead of where they moved entrances to here, and this is now a transfer stop, and it's called Unter den Linden. Um, and they're not depicting any of these stations. And if I click here, oh, it's still U55. It's been U5. 
In fact, it hasn't been U55. It hasn't been U55 since the early pandemic because they uh, just closed U55, which was a useless line, just three stations like this. And uh, in, in order to more easily prepare it for the U5 example. Um, so the um, so because things are not up to date here, they are not um, maybe they're not showing. Uh, the new high-speed line, but you can kind of see it, um, and all of its tunnels. And here you can see it hit Earth Airport. So this line that you can kind of see the, the trace of it, um, and then it's going to vanish because it's only start time from like Halle and Leipzig, and then just continue it this way to Berlin. They should be investing in that, but again, they're not because they think that. For, they have among the problems of German planners, um, and it's also German. In, in Europe, there's this idea that people that if you look at the research on air rail competition, it's very clear. Um, it's a continuous thing, and if you look at the research on the impact of trip times on uh, ridership, let me find the. No, it's not going to be transit. Else, this is going to be. Uh, there, it's a paper about Italy. Um, it is this one. It is uh, it is by uh, Cosetta. Not just Cosetta. It's yeah, Cosetta Coppola. Um, and um, and if you look here, um, let me see if the what's the elasticity that they're showing. Um, so they talk about so they talk about elasticity in terms in terms of model split, but you're not trying to do model split. You're trying to maybe reduce travel on other modes for green purposes, but you're building primarily to get ridership. So you want to look at ridership, and that's going to do better than model split because ridership rises um, but by more than other things fall because things get better. Um, and they do mention elasticities here. I forgot where. Direct elasticity values of HSR demand re irrespective of significantly greater if the one in absolute value were observed. Um, and they're talking about things that were already in pretty fast. Okay, so direct demand, uh, so they're talking about negative one uh, in terms of, el of elasticity, and um, they mention it varies, but for example, they talk about things that are negative 2.5, negative 1.3. Um, the oh, and, and that's model split. So if it's total volume, it's about negative two. That's my point. Uh, I didn't see this before. So the point is that if you take Berlin to Munich from four hours to three hours, you're increasing ridership by a factor of four thirds squared, give or take. And if you're taking it to the most aggressive thing I think you can do, which is about two and a half, then you're more than doubling ridership. Um, so getting from zero to now is about as valuable, and I mean, they did it in, they weren't at zero, as going from four hours to two and a half hours, and this is not something that I think planners here got. In France, the planners kind of fix, fix, kind of fix it on the idea of three hours, so they, instead of maybe doing a good rail work, they just try to get things down to the three hour mark, and here it's the four hour mark, and a lot of kind of good enough type thinking. Um, and, uh, and a lot of mentality and, and an annoying mentality that the only way to discipline this kind of approach is through competition, except you're not going to have two competing high speed lines. That's not going to happen. Um, so, when you do have competition, they compete for things like Wi Fi on the trains and mood lighting. And I mean, it's nice, but please get me faster trains to other cities. Thank you. Um, I mean, again, Wi Fi is nice, especially if the Wi Fi is not throttled, but. Um, that's a secondary effect, and so they're trying to do competition on something that's not very relevant. And, um, and, and because of this kind of good enough thinking, they underinvest in things like um, Berlin Halle. Again, 
this is not high speed money. This is um, capacity increases. Um, I will see. Uh, we'll try to see if they have, uh, or if it's even here. There's this. So we have this problem in Berlin, which is mostly about Berlin, not about the uh, Halle or Leipzig, but about Grozno, um, which is at this line. Um, so Berlin Dresden. Uh, that's the old line from Berlin to Dresden because it points from Berlin to let's zoom out Dresden. That line was reduced from four tracks to two after the war's war operations. So these two tracks went to the S-Bahn, which was okay because this was West Berlin. So it wasn't important as a as an intercity line between Berlin and Dresden because the intercity line from East Berlin to Dresden, which was also an eastern city, went through Ostbahnhof, which was called Hauptbahnhof at the time, going around all of this and then here. So dealing with the direct route was unimportant. Well, that was more than 30 years ago, and now maybe it is important to go from the new Hauptbahnhof to Dresden direct. So now they're foretracking this. Um, I'm forgetting the cost, and you do not know if it will be here. Um, okay, Leipzig, Dresden. Uh, oh, uh, this is uh, saving. This is increasing trip times from Berlin to Han uh, to Hanover um, on a line that's mostly new, but very heavily, heavily, heavily um, upgraded in part. So it's a so it's kind of actually a mixed. Uh, let's call it, let's call it a medium speed line. Um, and now they're trying to make it somewhat faster. Um, I do not know whether this is a reasonable cost. So Wolfsburg to Stendal. So Stendal is just outside the uh, city. Um, right, where, um, that's not Stendal. Is this Stendal? Not Stendal. Which one's Stendal? Wait, no, what am I talking about? Um, yeah, so this is Stendhal, sorry. Um, Stendhal, so there are some uh, weird slow restrictions here, like forgetting where. This is 77 kilometers. Um, no, I was not confusing Stendhal with Spandau. I was confusing Stendhal with Stocken. So I was confusing Stendhal with parts that are behind um, Spandau. Uh, because I know that they were planning on doing, because they know, or they are planning on doing expansion of the S-Bahn in this direction. Um, because it terminated in Spandau, because historically this was the Western S-Bahn operated by the East, but still only in the West. So it didn't need to go beyond Spandau. Um, and now that, um, there's reunification, they finally are, and they're, they're finally bothering to notice that Going to the west, the S1 terminates Spandau, and going to the east, the S1 goes deep into Brandenburg or Schaffstein. So they're trying to rebalance, and there's also more ridership because of that from the east and from the west. So they're trying to do a good thing, which is rebalancing. Um, so this is this extension. So, um, so no, I was confusing Spandau with Stacke, not with Spandau. I'm not that much in a living in a rock mode. But thanks for, yeah. For asking this. So this is again, it's about 76, 77 kilometers. And yeah, this is this is not high speed rail. I mean maybe in Spain it is, but here, yeah, this is a cut in uh construction. You're talking about going to a three hundred uh kilometers an hour, which is fine. I mean you can see it's a straight line. It's a, a line that's received two hundred fifty upgrades, so now they're making it three hundred. I can't comment on the cost in this. This is something they should probably be doing. Not an L foot, whatever. Um, I do not know things this far north. These are not high speed lines. Lübeck hasn't been an important city since probably the 15th century. Knut and Hamburg is just connections to Hamburg. I do not really know what they're talking about, what, what they're doing. Um, like, 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 what exactly in this slate of regional projects? It's kind of like so in our so in our so one of the things we should know about our cost comparisons is that we have very good knowledge of how much subways could, should cost, and this also includes regional rail tunnels. We have very good understanding of how much high-speed rail should cost. I can't tell you as precisely on like a 
general level as opposed to for project level, how much something like regional rail upgrades cost. Um, and they say just having costed the cost of plan. Um, so more Hamburg note, and this is more upgrades on Berlin Hamburg, which was supposed to be an hour 30 minus turnaround time and was only ever hundred an hour 30 and is now an hour 40. Just deterioration. More Berlin Halle. Um, actually, worse me because this was the other plus um, the other things would absolutely build you high speed on uh, about this. Oh, okay. This is the Berlin to Dresden, uh, right? Maybe that's not. Maybe it's something different. I think this is what I said. The quad track um, in the. I, I think this is the quad track that I mentioned before. Um, so that's no problem. Um, oh, they're doing Ingolstadt München finally. Um, so Berlin to. Uh, Munich, so Berlin to Leipzig or, or to Halle is, you can see, it's a pretty straight line, pretty flat. Um, Berlin to Leipzig is a little more than an hour. Um, and, uh, and then I guess if you do full, if you just go through the middle, it's an hour, and this should be probably half an hour. Um, and then from here, it's high speed through Air Fork, and then across these very thick tunnels, uh, thick mountains with heavy tunnels. They want to go farther east. One of these, I don't remember whether it was to go through Yen or through Bella, um, but either way, to go maybe like this and then to go more direct to, uh, to Nuremberg, and then bring a through a fit and demand that the line serve Elfort. Um, and it got this. So it's a small detour, but mostly it's just thicker mountains, so the extra tunnels meant that they didn't build all the way to Nildoy, but only to about Bambach. Um, so now from Bambach to Nildoy, it's slow. Nildoy to Ingolstadt is fast. And then, uh, this is an older line, so you can see it on uh, uh, an older high speed line, so, it's, so it is visible on Google. And you might ask, wait, well, where's the older line? The answer is there wasn't any. Um, trains used to go from Berlin to uh, Nuremberg via Augsburg. So this used to be the old main line. Um, and then they just went more direct via Ingolstadt. And now they're going to finally build Ingolstadt to München. Um, ideally, München to Nuremberg is doable in 45 minutes, but I understand it's a very aggressive timetable. Um, and... 53 minutes or something. I wouldn't hate it. I would dislike it, but I would not hate it. Um, so it's 71. Um, except that this is... So here we should... And this is not an... And this is not an NBS. NBS in Noi would be a... Fully no line. So this is not high speed rail, unfortunately. Oh, they're doing Oxbook Orm. Um, what they could do if they were aggressive is do Stuttgart to mention in an hour would be incredibly aggressive until they're doing half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. So these studies become not. Which, again, it's one of the things I dislike but do not loathe. Um, um, this is not high speed. It's also not high, um, not high speed. It's too illegal. It's all these random towns. Okay, so, okay, more, okay, so now we're talking about a third track uh, from Mansion to Dachau, and at this point, with all the stuff they're spending, that's my big critique of um, the don't bail high speed rail, just invest in the system situation, um, um, kind of, it's called meme in Germany, because here you're spending 42, 454, um, and where were we before? Here, 973. Um, and you piece all of these together, and that starts becoming a high-speed robot on, uh, on mentioned to Ingolstadt, which is not just mentioned to Ingolstadt, because that's also mentioned to Nuremberg and Point North. Um, so that interacts very well with all the things that they are building, like Nuremberg to Wildlog, to, uh, to Aschaffenburg, to Frankfurt. Um, it's like they're building nothing, they're just building too little, and 
thing and are trying to like kind of overly compromise. It feels a little bit northeast corridory. Um Wilfold Nunberg, which as a reminder is also getting a high speed line. More mention to uh Hengensburg. Um, um more uh more of Nunberg. Like it's I mean, this is why I'm kind of frustrated, as I said, by the by the German plans. There's somehow not enough attempts at cost control, or if there is, it's always about slowing down the trains. It's never about maybe deprioritizing places where nobody lives. Because, and again, I'm going to connect this to demographic issues because you can't. Oh, they are finally doing Hannover to Hamburg? Not Hannover to Hamburg, uh, to Hannover to Hamburg? Finally, yeah. Um, except they're doing it in an hour where there could be 45 minutes, and it's very nimby. Although, I mean, the cost, thankfully, I mean, which one is... Uh, I mean, I mean, they're, not, they're also not building in high speed the entire way, which is why it's an hour, not 45 minutes. Um, because, I'm sorry, but... Doing this in an hour is pretty fall. Pretty, pretty fall. How do you pronounce the word pretty fall? Because I'm, I'm used to, because you're not supposed to have short vowels and open syllables, so it's not pretty, it's pretty. But the syllable stops being open when you touch the suffix, so it's a, so it's a pretty fall or pretty fall. Um, but at any rate, um, that's not, I mean, again, the cost, the cost it's, it's a cost that I dislike, but do not love, but the trip time, I rather hate. Um, and that's even without a stop in hot work. Um, uh, let's see what else. Uh, this is more super. 21 related stuff from Schuttgart. Um, so, so anyway, I was saying before about the demographic issues is that from my perspective, um, yeah, of course you should build along a greenfield alignment here and yeah, use the fair when you can, but if someone complains that you're only overcompensating them 30% and not 300%, they can get lost. Um, these aren't a lot of people, like, not, I mean, this is not a high density area that lots of people live in. Um, these are densely, densely spaced villages, which aren't, you can just go around them. It's just people who, it's just from my perspective, yeah, you, you look at where most Germans live, and it's maybe not in Berlin or Hamburg, but absolutely is in places that are going to have, or benefit from high speed rail service. It's not going to be like 90% of Germany, but, um, but but you, you you add in Berlin and its suburbs and then places like Hamburg, Kiel, Lübeck, um, which and I mean Lübeck and Kiel are getting high speed trains, but they're so far north that speeding the trains from everywhere to Hamburg speeds the trains from everywhere to Lübeck, if that makes sense. Um, maybe Schwerin, but that's maybe a little more speculative to rebuild this. Is the high speed like Berlin to um, to Hamburg is a rare example of a good corridor for upgraded but never high speed trains because that doesn't connect to anything else other than Lübeck and Kiel. Um and to be fair, eventually Denmark. But because um for Berlin to points west you go for via Hanover, Hamburg to points west. I don't know what they do now, but when this gets high speed, it's gonna go through Hanover. Um so this is just Berlin Hamburg. For the most part, I mean, also, again, a couple of things like Berlin Lübeck, Berlin Kiel, Hamburg to um, to Dresden, maybe Hamburg to Leipzig is still faster this way than whatever else they're going to do this. Um, but these are not, but, but but it's not like where's Berlin Hanover? It's Berlin to Hanover and or Hanover rather, and the entirety of the line of the Rhine Road, um, and the entirety of Northern Westphalia. Anyway. Um, or, or even Berlin Bremen is via Hannover. So this is actually a more important node than this, even though Hamburg is a much bigger city than Hannover. Wasn't it, wouldn't a high-speed line through Lübeck to Copenhagen make sense? 
Yes. Thankfully, they're even planning on building one. Um, this is the fam. Uh, this, this is the. This is called the. Never gonna know the version. Femam. Yeah. Femam dot tunnel. So, the these are the lines reaching this. They're building a tunnel on this alignment and uh, for, for mixed passengers and freight. And they are also upgrading the trains on both sides. Um, so that you don't have to do train ferries and shit. Um, Denmark is, I believe, doing it better than Germany. I don't think Germany, I don't think Denmark is doing it well, but better than Germany. Um, so there's, for the most part, high speed stuff going up and uh, up until I believe K, um, or, or I guess Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz, it's going to be Kyrgyz or Kyrgyz. Also, it's a Danish word, so it's going to be, so it's just going to be K. Um. And if it works with it, it do not pronounce it correct, it would be sugar. Um, at any rate, so this is being built. Um, haphazardly and not very um not, not very systematically, unfortunately, because it's international, international stuff always has these themes. Um, to the point that the only really high ridership international lengths are Paris, L London, and even that underperforms domestic lengths. And um, Paris, Brussels, data it, it underperforms domestic links and it has decent ridership because Brussels speaks French and uh, the and it's not just Paris, Brussels, it's Paris to all of Belgium and the Netherlands. So even though they're, they're the, so even though the trip times are compromised north and east of Brussels and the fares are insane and the reservation systems aren't compatible with SNCF, they can still squeeze ridership out of those. Whereas this, um. Again, it's being built, but as I said, it's not being built well, unfortunately. It's something the EU should get involved in, but the EU doesn't get involved in anything that is visible to people, because people would get mad. It gets involved in regulations that nobody knows or cares about, until the Daily Mail decides that the most important issue in the entire universe is the shape of the British banana. Um, so, again, so remember, from my perspective... The people who demand tunnels, there aren't a lot of them. It's places where nobody lives. But from their perspective, they think they're more important. Again, they're older. They're all enfranchised daughters. They all know the. They probably all met the local member of the Bundestag. Um, forget the language issue. I mean, the language issue is very weird for me. Um, but and, and then but and, and then you have someone who's like, not even my age. I think twenty four. Just just got their masters or isn't getting their masters, um, just moved to Hamburg or Berlin or wherever, or to Hannover to get a job, um, they don't count for that. And this person is decently likely to be an immigrant and then be, and so disenfranchised. And if, and if it's someone who is enfranchised, like politicians are never going to actually talk to this person. Um, remember, that Donald House in Berlin severely underrepresents um, racial minorities. We're a city that's about 18% people of color. The Algodnaton House, that not the one that we're about to vote for, but the outgoing one is uh, seven out of 160 are based on the last name of non white origin. So, four and a half percent. It's going to get better, judging just by the names on the posters. And yes, I live in a more diverse neighborhood, so this proportion is going to be the full neighborhood. It's going to be, it's going to get better. I don't think it's going to get good. I don't think we're going to, I mean, 18% times 160 is 29. We're not getting 29. Uh, members of the Abgoldnet and House of uh, Yeah, the a lot of the, the upgraded German connection with them is finished years after the Yeah, it's likely, although you never know. I mean the uh, this is not a difficult part to build, unlike the Alp connections and the Falman uh, and the Falman belt is kind of hard to tunnel because it's an underwater tunnel. But you never know. I mean like I mean, it's German rail infrastructure. I mean, yes, they can always screw things up. Um, by the way, I, I was going to say before, one of the reasons I'm voting Green, I mean, so I'm, never, I'm definitely not voting Dillinger. I have 11 different reasons. Essentially, Dillinger are all the problems of Espada and the city and all the problems of the Greens, but also additional problems, like they're a lot less diverse. They're all less racially diverse. They don't care. Um, and it's not just Zara Fagenknecht being um being very folkish, it's the entire party. Um, being like, at best, oh, we like immigrants, but not in our party. I mean, yeah, they're, they're going to have like 
They have right now one, I believe, member of non-European migration background. They're going to get more. Um, again, judging by names on posters, they're not going to get proportionally enough. Um, and the Greens are slightly better at it than us, but um, what else is there? Okay, this is everything. Not in my name. Uh, and so they're building, they're spending, they're, we are about to spend 48 and a half billion euros on something that is not high speed rail. Um, and, and for somehow, and somehow, uh, Mannheim Stuttgart is still not going to be under half an hour, even though it absolutely is possible to do so. They just need to overclock the trains from 250 to 280 on a line that was built for 280. Um, so, my crayon at French costs would be about, I believe, about 30. Now, maybe it's harder in Germany, but that would, it's not 100 versus 30 harder. It's maybe 50 versus 30. So, it's probably comparable to how much I think Germany should be spending on a high speed rail system, except it's not going to be high speed rail. Um, and this is always the problem with these kinds of um, build. It, it, it's, it's a kind of overbuilding in, in a sense. In the same way that um, France um, and even more to Spain have this overbuilding problem, which is they. Oh, so, so, in, so Spain is actually a better example of than France. So Spain has the world's worst job. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but. Among, let's call it the developed countries that are Spain sized or more, Spain plausibly has the worst geography for high speed rail. Um, because um, in France, they talk about how everything orbits Paris and it's all cities from different directions. But at the end of the day, Lille, Paris, Lyon, Marseille, yes, no, I don't think any train serves more than two of these at once, but that's since you have choice to build things poorly. And even then, um, the stuff that they do well, like Paris, Lyon, Paris, Marseille, they do very well. Um, and then in Britain, it's London on one line, let's call it high speed two. You're getting London to Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool. You can't do both on the same line, but not critical at the high frequencies that you're getting out of the city sizes in question. And then whoop, all the way to Scotland. Um, only stuff that is not going to be on. A high speed tour that's basically a connection, uh, basically a, not a connection, uh, an express bypass for more capacity of the West Coast Main Line is um, the Yorkshire city, and also the East Midlands cities that are not as big, but the Yorkshire cities, so Leeds and Sheffield. Um, and that's and that's just the brand. Um, so Britain has pretty good geography for high speed rail. Germany keeps talking about how it has poor geography for high speed rail because it's uh, because it's somehow uh, polycentric, but it's bullshit. Like, um, at a nationwide scale, Germany has better geography than France because the cities are kind of at the right locations um, for, the, for these things. Italy, I mean, the Apennines are hard to tunnel under, but all the cities are on one line. Naples, Rome, uh, Florence, Bologna, Milan, Turin. One line. And then you can also do things to... Uh, 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 to Brescia and Verona and, uh, and Venezia. Um, so Spain, uh, and by the way, if, and yes, I'm only looking at Europe, not because Asia doesn't exist. Korea and Japan are really good for this. Um, the US is good in bad parts. The Northeast is amazing. Um, so Spain has Madrid, which is in the center of the country because it was a dedicated early modern capital. Uh, beforehand, the court moved. So, um, so, so a lot of pre-modern states, by the way, don't have capital. So, if you're asking in the old, in the era of old English, like the era before the Norman conquest of England, what was the capital of England? And I mean, yes, you can say Winchester, but a lot of the early kingdoms didn't have capitals. The king moved. The court was wherever the king was. So there might be little towns. We're talking about. A place where a town of 5,000 would be considered a giant metropolis. Um, and mostly um, castles of local lords. Um, this being like the early Middle Ages, it would be Martin Bailey or something. And the king moves, and the king and his retainers move and like uh, are hosted by the various um, lords. And of course, it's a great honor to host the king. And the capital is wherever the king is. Um, 
And um, so Spain got into the act of having a permanent capital later than comparable um, late medieval monarchies like England and France, like London was a thing, I'm forgetting one, but high middle ages, uh, Paris, maybe even before. Um, and then there was Madrid, which I, I don't know if Madrid was built from scratch or was a small town that was elevated, but there were a bunch of competing possible capitals for Castile. Um, Argon, I think, was just Barcelona, I think. Um, and so there was, so they built its purpose-built capital, which was also far from river transport, um, which is why it is so high, um, like 600-something meters above sea level and not on a river. Like, let's say, how, um, what's Toledo going to be? Yeah, to, okay, so Toledo's on the high side. Maybe these are not, I mean, maybe it's semi-arid, so the rivers aren't as big, but Toledo is... Or something. Toledo, Toledo. Toledo is an American city. Um, and so everything else was on water. I mean, yeah, there were some Castilian cities that weren't like and like Toledo and uh, in, um, and Valladolid, but the largest city other than Madrid is Barcelona. And yes, Saragossa is in the middle and it's nice, but everything else, look, Madrid and then Barcelona, Valencia, Alicante, Granada. Um, okay, yeah, Sofia and uh, Cadiz are kind of the same thing, but you're not, I mean, but you're going to need to split from in, in, in Cordova to get to, to Malaga. Um, and then um, the cities of Galicia, um, like uh, Coruña and, and, and Biro, uh, and it's not important, and then the Basque, uh, and then the Basque country. So, uh, so Bilbao, and so, so it's called the Basque wine. It's, so it's a, uh, I believe it's going to be, so I believe it's these three studies. No, 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 and uh, thankfully, Madrid and Barcelona are large and growing. But so, so they built the lines that are good, like start with Sevilla, which I think was a political thing, um, and then Cadiz, and now they have a, and they have some branches going out towards Malaga and shit, um, and they have Madrid to Barcelona. And essentially, I won't say all or almost all of the high-speed rail ship in Spain is. Madrid to Barcelona and Madrid to, um, on, on like this line, whether it's, I, I forget it, I don't think it's going to be just to Sevilla. I think it's also going to be to Cadiz and, um, and, and Marbella and, and Malaga. Wait, not Marbella, it's not an important city. Malaga. And, and the other lines are a lot weaker to Valencia, to Alicante. Um, and it's going to probably get better because this line is not yet complete. So they built the hard part first. Not the hard part first, the hard parts first to Bilbao. Um, and data with um, Santiago de Compostela and the Coronia. But these are kind of scratch. This is kind of not scratch. It's kind of like scraping the bottom of the barrel. And now they're doing things like Valencia, Alicante. Um, these are not. So it's, so it kind of exists in the sense of Spain being like too aggressive and over expanding. This with France doing the same. Macron just finally announced that they're going to build rather useless high-speed lines, like from Paris to random Norman cities, where the distance to Paris is close enough that they probably care more about frequency. To uh, to uh, to Rouen and to La Havre and to Caen, um, and um, and and again, this is understandable as a kind of overexpansion. Okay, I mean the concept of overexpansion of infrastructure is well understood, I believe. My claim is that Germany is overexpanding, but overexpanding not high speed rail, but um, medium speed upgrades. Um, well, and, and in general, when you have two systems that work together and you over and, and you spend too much on one, I, let's not even say too much. When you have two connecting systems and um, you invest a lot in one of them, you usually create um, high return on investment for uh, investing in the other one. 
So these might be systems like high-speed rail and connecting transit. Um, these can be regional rail and suburban bus connections. Um, these can be um, subway lines in a city in different directions. Once you're building the first line, you're making this. You're not making the second one weaker. Maybe if it's a maybe if you have two parallel alignments that you're choosing between, the, you build the first one, then the second one becomes weaker because people just walk or take a bus to the first one. Um, but if these are two widely separated lines, let's say perpendicular, then building the first one strengthens the second one because you're strengthening all the stations on the first line. The first line probably is going to go, let's say the first line is a north-south subway through city center. You're strengthening city center. So now, uh, because of all of these north-south connections, and then the east-west connection through city center becomes more valuable because city center is bigger. And of course, you're not just going to city center. You're going to all of the uh, places north and south of city center on your, on your north-south lines. This is how subway systems get built. You build the first really strong line, and then the others kind of fall into place. Um, it's a Metcalf law thing, except maybe not as easily explainable or not as formulaically beautiful as my high-speed rail and Metcalf's law uh, um, posts from last year. And so Germany has optimized not as well as Switzerland, don't get me wrong. Switzerland is better. Austria is better. Netherlands are better. Is are. Um, but Germany is optimizing better than France for good medium speed connections. But now you need to unleash the thing that they connect to because the point isn't to connect people from Lübeck just to Hamburg or from people from Kiel to just to Hamburg or people from um, Bremerhaf just to um, Bremen or people from Regensburg only to München. Um, so, so they're spending so much money on um, München to to Regensburg, to um, line from München to Landshut to Regensburg. Um, and I will point out, by the way, that um, if you have better high speed line, your connection points probably going to be in Kostad. But um, so connecting Regensburg, so travel is more local than long distance, right? So München to Regensburg is important, but people, in, but I mean München, like. The metro area of Munich is 3 million people. Germany, we're a country of 84 million people. How many more? It's going to depend on whether we're going to get a good immigration policy or a racist immigration policy. At this point, my money is on racist, just because even though um, the majority of Germans in a poll from August said that Germany should resettle African refugees, um, the most left-wing person, on the, the most left-wing party leader on immigration and okay, and then book, the Greens are always the best of us. Uh, I think she was talking about twenty thousand people, um, and there are millions. And we took in about a million Syrians in twenty fifteen, and um, that made Merkel very popular. Um, but everyone took second chance to do something that was demonstrably successful, um, economically, socially, politically. Um, just because people ask about what about the backlash or something. Um, so, um, but I mean, th th I mean that, that matters more for transit for level though. I mean, 80 million Germans, let's say 75 million Germans because low birth rate versus 90 million or 100 million. Yeah, it, may, it matters for infrastructure. It does, it's a second order effect. Um, but, but anyway, the point is there's 80 million Germans who do not live in or around Munich. So, yeah, connecting Regensburg to Mansion better, yeah, it's useful. Um, but if you have high speed trains that go from everywhere to Mansion, and that includes Mansion and Ingolstadt, uh, and remember, Ingolstadt Nuremberg is already fast. Then people from Regensburg, maybe they ride a direct train, a, a train direct to Nuremberg, and from Nuremberg they get to everywhere they want. Frankfurt, sure. Um, on what should be an hour, not from Frankfurt to Wilsburg, but an hour from Frankfurt to Nuremberg. And then two hours get you to Köln. Um, right now, Frankfurt Köln is a little more than an hour. It can be a little less than an hour to be fair. Um, and then with the connect, maybe connection in Frankfurt or whatever, Nuremberg to Mannheim could be an hour and a half. Um, so yeah, so you, then then you go to Mannheim. Um, now Bavarians think that if you go too far north, uh, everyone is uh, an unemployed uh, queer uh, drug addict. 
Um, so maybe they don't want to visit Berlin, but maybe some of their queer children uh, move to Berlin for that reason. I mean, probably, I mean, I guess if you're a queer child and your parents have like very stereotypically rural Bavarian views, then you're moving to München and not Berlin, but some people, but I mean, I also know queer people who lived as queer people in München and for whatever reason moved to Berlin. Um, apparently, Ber I mean, the, the main queer centers of Germany are Berlin and München, but it's hard for me to judge because I'm Berlin, so I talk to the people who moved mentioned to Berlin, so I hear the complaints about mentioned from Berlin and not the reverse. My impression is that Berlin is a bigger queer center at this point than Mention. Um, but, anyway, but whatever, I mean, okay, so I have a queer person in Mention, and now they can get to a queer friend in Berlin in four hours and with better hospitals be two and a half. But remember, this also cascades down to the queers of Regensburg, whose parents let's say, have stereotypically Bavarian views and therefore they don't live with them anymore. And therefore, maybe they're in Nürnberg and maybe they're in Berlin. But that's a thing. I mean, you can travel this way from Regensburg to Berlin much faster if there's a better high-speed route. Um, and to Hamburg and so on. So this is something where Germany kind of over-invested in these regional connections and these, and, and these I don't even call them medium-speed connections. I say medium-speed. I'm thinking about Trains averaging 120 kilometers an hour. These don't. Um, but so let's say so let's say Germany has a good low speed rail system, and now the complement of that is high speed rail and the strongest links, and that's not being built, unfortunately. Um, and, and again, this is something that I wish there were like YMB party in local politics and municipal politics that called for green growth rather than more highways. Um, and then nationally, it would be calling for more interurban infrastructure, right? not infrastructure, infrastructure for, for more inter for more intercity infrastructure rather than for trying to squeeze ridership out of one more village. Where um, maybe if it's a Bavarian village or a Saxon village, then I'm, I can live there, and like my name is not going to get me thrown rocks at. But can Two men hold. I mean, yeah, maybe I guess focus urban enough that they should not stereotype, but but I've heard enough. Uh, but, but I mean, but I've heard enough horror stories about Bavaria that, to some extent, they do stereotype. I would apologize, but people who just voted for homophobes should apologize to me. Is Germany a good place for to start commuting? Uh, yes, but it's not going to look anything like Japan. In Japan, it is asymmetric. This is by the way where I'm saying Germany is really good for high speed rail. Um, it's uh, the population density here is really good for high speed rail. That of Japan is also really good for high speed rail from a completely different purpose. So from a completely not completely from a completely perp uh, from a completely different perspective. Words. So in Japan, high um, high density means your cities are really close together. So you can have one um, Tokaido, Shinkansen, uh, Tokyo, uh, uh, Shizuoka, Namatsu, uh, and uh, uh, Nagoya and uh, and Osaka, and somehow th that single line can just can even hit all the three main centers of Kihanshin. Uh, and, uh, and then you have all these asymmetric commuting, th so things like Mishima to Tokyo, or Shizuoka to Tokyo, or Atami to Tokyo. And yeah, and as in everyday, people in Tokyo absolutely do People in uh, I shouldn't say in Tokyo if they live in Mishima. People in France also don't. I shouldn't say in Paris because certainly if you're commuting for an hour on the TGV every day from a uh, tool or, or something to Paris, you do this. I mean, you're not doing this because you can't afford Paris because um, either you have enough money for a pass or your employer thinks you're valuable enough as an employee to subsidize your pass. If you're like that if you're, and you're not living in Paris, you don't like Paris. Yeah, so stuff like, oh, oh, you mean the Otsunomiya, uh, the, the Otsunomiya the Takasaki range? Yeah, and I just remember the stops in the Tokaido Shinkansen better. Um, so these would be the Atami, these would be the, or the Odawaras, the, the Atami. Um, is Germany a good place for this? So the answer is yes. So these are, it is not true that no French people like Paris for some reason. Um, what is true is that in the same way that in Germany there's this idée fixe uh, that um, every... Uh, that, that every 65-year-old uh, NIMBY who knows the best engineering of 40 years ago uh, 
often in a different field. Um, and I say often in a different field because our one of the judges, at least, who uh, struck down some uh, lockdown rules uh, about a year ago, turns out to not be um, qualified in this, is a family judge who just believes in conspiracy theories. Um, so, so they have the same thing in France in which every person with an anti-city identity who comes to the city to throw rocks is automatically real French. Um, and um, so, no, it's not true that no French like Paris. Quite a lot of French people live in Paris, for one. Um, and so, no, it's... So, so the, the point is, France and Japan have asymmetric commuting. Germany would have symmetric commuting. So we're talking about people living about an hour from the city to commute. Um, so what is an hour from München? It is Ingolstadt, definitely even today, and with high-speed rail, even something that's fast, but not especially aggressive. I mean, München to Nuremberg is, what, 150, 160 kilometers? 150 direct. Uh, if I has to be probably 106, 170. That would, I mean, even doing this in an hour, that means you commute, you're doing commutes, Nuremberg to München. And maybe that's a little asymmetric, but Nuremberg and Ingolstadt are two of the richest cities in Germany. Um, these are filthy, wealthy cities. Ingolstadt is an industrial city, and now, um, Corner, you're from Britain. Pony, you're from Czechia. Um, industrial cities in this context does not mean um, a place with a coal mine and a coal plant that only exists uh, because uh, it's being subsidized so that the people um, don't throw rocks at immigrants. And then uh, international media says it's because Germany closed nuclear plants. No, it's um, these are places where the, all the big firms that make expensive German cars are headquartered, so they're actually very well off. Um, so that, that would be Ingolstadt, or also I think our single richest city is actually Wolfsburg, to the point that the commuting, so Wolfsburg is absolutely high speed rail commuting distance from Berlin, it might even be so today, it definitely is from Hanover. People do the reverse commute, this is how wealthy Wolfsburg is, not S is. Um, so a place like Wolfsburg to Hannover, or even Wolfsburg, uh, Berlin, um, especially given faster trains, absolutely. Um, even Hamburg to Wolfsburg, Hamburg to Hannover and, and, and back, Hannover to Bremen. I mean, Bremen might actually be less symmetric just because Bremen is a lot poorer than Hamburg. Um, um, Leipzig to Berlin, Dresden to Berlin has become kind of plausible. Halle to everywhere. Halle is industrialized. German, East German city. Um, Magdeburg would have been great, but the choice of high-speed line from Berlin to uh, Hannover, because they mostly took an existing line and modded, um, and also this was planned in the 80s uh, as an East German thing that would connect, or, a West, or rather a West German thing through East German territory, connecting West Berlin with Hannover, and would, um, skipping all the intermediate stops, and apparently this will include the um, Western Brunswick. Um, the uh, line that was approved even in the 90s as a unity project to subsidize the East, the poorer East, it skipped Magdeburg um, and, and Brandenburg and, uh, and, and Brandenburg and Havel. Um, so th this is how much legacy stuff we carry in Germany. Yeah, in Britain, those places are in southern England. Uh, oh, oh, you mean the manufacturing towns? Um, because when I think of the manufacturing town in Britain, I think about um, Wigan. Or, um, like, like, like I'm thinking about places that Orwell was writing about. Wigan? Wigan? How is it pronounced? Um, oh, oh, you don't have rich places unless you're counting Prague. I've been to Prague, okay? Prague? I, I mean, is Prague Munich? No, but... I mean... But it's still... Decently well off, and yes, the, the fact that it, I mean, yes, knowing the average incomes there, yes, it's not West Western Europe rich, but it is the richest city in Eastern Europe. Um, and my point is that these are places where you're absolutely going to get um, symmetric computing. Um, and of course, once you're getting to things like Nova and Frankfurt, of course, yeah, finance like a finance person lived here and worked in Frankfurt.
that happens all that, that, that would happen. I mean, I shouldn't say it happens all the time. It would happen all the time if it were an hour and not two hours. Um, and but conversely, again, Nuremberg has a huge economy. Um, it's I, I mean, the so, so this region, Mittelfranken, I think might actually be wealthier than um, than Hessen Darmstadt. Um, it's maybe it's not as or maybe it's comparable. It's not as wealthy as. Obilbayan, because nothing is as wealthy as Obilbayan, except maybe San Francisco, but I mean, that's still lots of good jobs here, um, or something somatic like that, like, like I, can, I can totally say something like um, two-income couples, like a lot of uh, things with um, uh, with two-body problems, um, so two people living in book and doing you know, one, one taking the train half an hour to Nürnberg, one taking the train half an hour to Frankfurt. That is absolutely a thing that can happen here. Um, Mlada Boleslav. Um, oh, oh, it has a huge car plant. Okay, so we're um, where uh, VW actually has headquarters, which is Wolfsburg. It's actually rich. Um, okay, that, okay, so this was also 20 years ago, and also Munich is very uniquely wealthy um even by southern german standards like munich is i shouldn't say southern german because hamburg is also wealthy um there's wealth like nuremberg frankfurt stuttgart mannheim uh Karlsruhe, hamburg wealth probably also about this like stockholm wealth brussels wealth paris wealth and then you have munich which is I think maybe 20% richer than all of these places. Like, Munich is very Munich. Um, and you'd expect that in such a wealthy, uh, safe, high services place, the uh, schools in Bavaria are very well regarded um, by the German middle class. The expression gymnasium in the south is very snooty. Uh, and you'd expect that this place uh, would have people clamoring from all over Germany to live there, but actually, no, it uh, has net emigration with uh, its suburbs and uh, net emigration of German citizens. More than 100% of Munich's growth is immigrant. Um, I will not stop calling Germans racist as a, as a collective, if, you, if you're wondering. Um, anyway, um, are there questions? It's been Two, I want to say two hours, less than two hours since they're recording, so we have seven more minutes if you want to do it two hours even, but um, more than two hours since they started streaming. So if there are any questions, please ask. Um, and they could be election related, they can be what does election mean for transportation related, they can mean what the whatever. Um, or, or just pure German transport. German intercity transport issues. What's my opinion on Schultz? I mean, whatever. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's everyone's opinions of Schultz. Like, so, um, Merkel is hideously popular. Um, and this is a post-2015 thing. Um, and uh, so essentially, she's incredibly depolarizing, which means that the people who hate her the most are the people who want our politics to look more like American or Greek or whatever politics. Um, Britain, Britain doesn't quite supply that even. I mean, it has enough very snorefesty people like Keith, Keir, however he pronounces his name. I know it's not Keith. Keir, Keir, Starmer, whatever. Shorts. So, so a lot of it is, so Schultz was always running the boring campaign, the, hi, you know you guys like Merkel, right? Uh, I'm in Merkel's cabinet, vote for me, not for uh, Laschet, who is far away, and it's very clear that nobody likes him. Um, that has always been Schultz. Um, kind of like just saying, oh, this is our SPD agenda, hi, I'm in the government, vote for us, for continuity. Um, and again, it worked, essentially, because, um, let me show you the polls again. You know which elections are coming, but if I put an O in uh, Wikipedia, you see which polling aggregation I look at. So, actually, this is a good one. See this? 
So this is when Baerbock, so Baerbock gets announced around here and then the Greens insta jump. This is, and then come the, and then two things happen. The negative campaign of, uh, CDU and its party organs, um, which include, again, our, our most red tabloid built. Uh, and the, and a second thing happens, which is, um, the third wave of Corona, the alpha wave gets suppressed through vaccination. Um, and, uh, so, so this is when the third wave was happening, when they realized, uh, so second wave is around here at the peak. Um, and then there are the scandals where it turns out that the minister of health was spending, was getting the state to spend, uh, six euros a piece on medical masks, uh, like, like not quite N95, but like FFP2 masks for, uh, vulnerable people uh, for distribution thereof, when you could get this at every Aldi for Euro 50. Um, so the scandals, this happened, and then third wave was happening, the alpha wave, and then Baerbock sh- uh, and shot up, and a lot of um, bickering with with them um, that was made very public about um, whether the union would run uh, Laschet or uh, uh, CSU's uh, Marcus Zoder. Um, and then the, there was the Tadeo Tesu party unity, but also importantly, the suppression of the fourth point, uh, not the fourth point, the third point. Um, and this happens. Um, Schultz is basically, I mean, people keep mocking Schultz as being not even a major party around here. And then, uh, there are more, um, Tadeo scandals and, uh, we're starting getting the fourth wave starting around here, uh, the Delta wave. And then this. Now, the negative campaigning was directed at the Greens because up until about here, they were the only real town to say, oh, so suddenly they, so they were tailored because so they were, t- they weren't saying vote for us because the left sucks. Nobody would buy that if it, if it were that kind of agenda debate. They said, no, vote for us because Baerbock, uh, uh, because Baerbock, uh, faked her degree. A, she got a real degree from a British university. Um, she's not like us. Uh, plus a lot of sexist innuendo by the editor of Belt, Julian Weichelt, who also hates Merkel because he's a sexist. He has uh, committed um, sexual harassment. So he has, uh, so, so technically, there, so there were complaints from within Belt. They, there was a short internal uh, investigation that naturally cleared him because it's not like the internal investigation is independent in any way, shape, or form. And then uh, he pretends he never did that. He absolutely did. Um, and uh, so so they were optimizing for very specific kinds of uh, fake scandals about Baerbock. And now Schultz is, uh, so they neglected to attack Schultz. Hence this. And um, li- likewise, when there were specific, Sedeu specific scandals, compare what happened to FDP, which after the, so this is a Turingia scandal where they, Collaborated with IFD very briefly, um, and then Corona kills, but not quite, weakens IFD because people start caring about government competence. And uh, then it turns out Sato is not actually government competence. And uh, but people who want a right wing alternative without its uh, without the Sato back um, the, the Sato baggage. Um, so my opinion on Charles is. Oh, hi. Hi, thanks, Rocky. Um, are there, does that answer your question, Warner? Awesome. Uh, are there any other questions? Again, they can be election related. They can be election transport um, interface. They can be just pure intercity transport. Uh, DB's intercity punctuality is bad. Uh, why? Because they uh, are not very. So I will say they're not very competent. But specifically, the there's reliability center design, um, which DB understands and is implementing, but it is lagging its neighbors. So DIB's intercity punctuality is bad compared with Switzerland, compared with the Netherlands, compared with Austria. I have no idea about Belgium. France overall is, I believe, less punctual than Germany. 
Now, with the TGV system, it's more punctual as long as you're staying on an LGV and not uh, venturing on a TGV from an LGV to a classical line. And then if you're on a classical line, then good luck. Um, but um, but if you're just taking the TGV between Paris and Lyon, Paris and Marseille, that's fine. It's a dedicated high-speed line. These are much easier to keep on schedule. Thus, for example, uh, in Japan, uh, there's much better reliability on the Shinkansen than on the um, commuter trains. Uh, do I think I, uh, do, oh, do my high speed rate, um, rail riderships, uh, ridership models rely on urban or metro? Metro. Um, and it will defend metro and not urban. Uh, this is especially important in Germany where there's massive, massive difference between urban and metro because the cities have edges and then the suburbs are past these edges. So even a place like Oranienburg, which is literally on the S Bahn, has gaps. Small gaps, but gaps in urbanization with Berlin. Um, so um, it has to be metro, especially, and again, especially in the context where metro. So Germany does not really have clearly defined metro areas. There are a bunch of different definitions, all of which are politicized. Um, but especially if you define based on S-Bahn rate, it makes a lot of sense because Oranienburg absolutely does participate in any kind of ridership that you're going to get out of intercity trains to Berlin, because how are you going to travel from Oranienburg to anywhere in Germany that's not within easy driving distance? And two Americans are watching this. I say easy driving distance, not Midwestern American driving distance, where you guys uh, drive for something like, uh, what is it, 12 hours with stops and think that's normal. No, I mean like normal, I mean two hours driving. Um. So from Melanie and Book, yeah, maybe you'll drive to Hamburg because the freeway is more convenient. And if you live in Melanie and Book and are not worried, probably on a car. Um, but most likely, if you're going, but even then, you might take a train and most likely going anywhere else. And um, what are you going to do? You are going to uh, take the S-Bahn to the city, to city center. And then you will take an intercity train to wherever, to, and you don't even need to go to the city center because um, a lot of interested trains stop at Gesundbahn, the north-south train. Um, so the, uh, you're not going to make you schlep like this on the one and then go to Hauptbahnhof because you could just go to Gesundbahn and then take a train, a north-south train to Gesundbahn to a place like Dresden, uh, Leipzig, München. Um, so metro, not urban. Um, so to listen, thanks, Maraki. Did I answer your questions? Awesome. Twist? Awesome. Uh, are there any other questions? Let's give people like three more minutes or something. If there are questions that are complicated or then a string of questions, then I'll take more time. But why is there so little on German rail in English? Because public transport planning is uh, not globalized. And unfortunately, places that globalize, um, uh, places that globalize tend to anglicize, so they suck. Um, I mean, I have. I mean, yes, I've seen some. I mean, honestly, I haven't seen that much in um, in Japan uh, in English. I mean, there's some uh, which I suspect. Yeah, um, France is very hermetic. Germany is very hermetic. Japan is very hermetic. In Japan, like, I mean, I can't tell because um, so. Yeah, Germans don't like speaking English if they don't have to, but they all speak English. For all, uh, where for all, you should understand people with engineering degrees. Um, but uh, because in Germany, if you don't have an engineering degree and are white, you're not fully young, unfortunately. And um, but anyway, no, it's not because people here don't like speaking English. I mean, people in Japan speak. And um, speak shit English. People in France are in the middle. No, it's again, it's very hermetic. It's not globalized. It's especially hard to globalize because there's no, there's no single global model other than and everyone acts like they're in America model. Um, if it's something that America sucks at, why would anyone do that? Um, like, there's no gain from that. I mean, there's a gain from doing 
tech in English because, yeah, people want to be like American tech. And even when Japan was very good at tech in the 90s, America still had very good tech. Like, I mean, Microsoft was a thing in the 90s. I mean, yes, the consumer electronics were Japanese feature phones, like in the 2000s, but it's not like America was nothing. On the contrary. So things that are where the U.S. and maybe Britain are good at, yeah, people will um, do in English, and that's kind of a showing point language. But things that are, are – there's no real model of, let's say, Europeans speaking English to one another. And it, to the extent there is, often it's the most boring, eurocratic Brussels insider thing ever, um, kind of reproducing all of the problems of the American federal government that people who nudge but don't do. Um and so this is why there's also very little learning between the big traditions. Um, now, there is learning but, um, in countries that, for like great reasons, um, figured that they need to speak four languages. So uh, uh, so they did, you speak only your native languages and English. That's if you only have a bachelor's or a master's or something. Um, and then they absolutely will send planners to Germany, to France to, to, to learn in, in a place like Italy or Spain. But it's in, in a lot of ways out of necessity or perceived necessity. I mean, perceived and also real necessity, but my point is that France and Germany often have that necessity as well and we don't realize it. Um, so, so that's why it's this insular. Um, and, again, and again, I don't find that much information out of Japan and English, maybe a little bit because of a lot of... Um, is it called weeaboos in English? Um, like people who are like big fans of... Uh, Japan, like, I think it's like Weibo is Japan, Weibo is China, and then Korea is Korea. Um, by the way, there's even less in English out of Korea than out of Japan. The, the way that I, um, I've, so, so remember, I've been able to get, yeah, I mean, I've been able to get um, through English language sources, and I mean, yeah, I wanted to require me to read something in Japanese, but it's number, that's fine, um, about um, historic subway costs, uh, historic metro construction costs in Japan. I've not seen any such thing in, out of Korea except to, like, pay Abdashi to here to um, brief us on Korea and, like, translate things for us. Um, so there are things in English about Germany. The problem is, like, things in English about Germany are things like me and Richard Benarek. Um the, the magazines are going to be in, in German, and yeah, I mean, I guess JRTR has an English edition, and there's no comparable German example of a magazine with an English edition, they're all in German. But um, the, um, uh, but, but, but as I said, it's because it's a very insular uh, industry where the returns to globalization exist but are not apparent. Or even not just globalization, pan-Europeanization, I'm like, Germany learning from France about the things France does better and France learning from Germany about the things that Germany does better. They're capable of doing that when they have to. It's just... Chinese researchers do publish a fair bit on HSR in English. I also do not have full data on high-speed rail construction costs in China in English. Um, whereas, again, in Japan, I can get you every single line except maybe Tokaido. Um, in English, and even in Tokaido, there are books about this that I have not read. And in Korea, I mean, it's all recent, also, so it's easier to get, and we have everything. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I know that it's very insular, and I'm, like describing Germany as an insular place that is resisting the high-speed rail revolution. Oh, granular stuff like aerodynamics and tunnel boom. Um, my understanding is that these are not big. Oh, oh, you mean in China, because in Germany, these are not big topics of research, or at least not public research. In Sweden, they've done a lot of this. It's called, uh, called Grönetorget. I'm pronouncing it like it's ancient. It's Grönetorget. Uh, um, it should be in Swedish. And, um, the, and, and I don't know the aerodynamics literature, but my understanding is that it's something that Japan is a lot more advanced at than Germany. Um, I don't think we even pressurize the trains. And we have a lot of tunnels. We just don't pressurize the trains. We have giant tunnels and stuff. Um, are there, um, am I answering your questions about this? About the insularity problem? Like, I'm not explain. like, 
I'm speculating this is why the insularity is a thing. Like, we're not doing a full debate about Germany or France in our course report. Um, but whenever I talk to sources from what's called poor Europe, so France, Germany, low countries, there's, I mean, you do get this kind of, oh, why should we learn from the Italians kind of mentality? So, but like talking to America, I mean, you see this in my mentions on Twitter and my comments when I unloaded on, Par on Paris's highest in the world, rolling stock costs and all of the um, excuse and, and all of the excuses come out. Um, are, anyway, are there any questions? Any, any more questions? Let's call them. Yeah, no, TS, uh, no, the EU mandated centers are published in English, and I think some of them are even publicly available without making you pay 50 euros for a printed copy. Um, so somehow the EU is really bad at making people like who are not loaded actually read all of its regulations, not that the US is any better at it. Like in the US, I believe one of the things that got Aaron Swartz prosecuted was that he used academic access, like, like he, he used MIT academic access to uh, download a list of uh, all current enforceable laws in the United States and um, uh, and posted them publicly because apparently that's like, because apparently the collated list is under copyright or some shit, private copyright even. Um, but yeah, no, 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 the standards are published in English. The problem is that, like, I'm not describing standards, I'm describing traditions. And traditions are always the world of yesterday. And, I mean, who speaks English here and who doesn't? Um, by the way, are there any other questions? Because if not, I can end this. Oh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the TSI on this is basically a join of the various European regs, and that is, in fact, what they do. Um, it's not because higher deficiency is higher where I think it's they're worried that the trains can't handle it. Um, like, in, in Japan, I think it's pretty recent that they increased the non-tilting count efficiency, and even that, it's, not, it's higher, but I don't think it's that much higher. I think the... So I think maybe at this point, the non-tilt or the net of tilt count efficiency is something like 130. But that's very recent, and before then it was something like 100. And yes, this is bad. Uh, especially bad when they're building more tunnels for, for the curves. Like, there's a reason that there's a, there are things like uh, recommended uh, and limit values for things. So you want to do ATS recommended, go ahead, but um, please allow better things for limit. Um, like it's done today, um, total equivalent count of 310, I believe, uh, on things like current to Frankfurt and I think also a few other difficult lines being built here. So 310 is not 80 because it's that plus count efficiency, but these are non tilting. Uh, Sorry, these are not these are these are not trains with infinite cant. That I believe it's there might actually be wait, there might actually be 130 cant efficiency, 180 cant. Yeah, oh, okay, they do have exceptions for difficult environments. Yeah, okay. The problem is, uh, this is not quite a difficult environment. These are difficult people, if that makes sense. Um, so you absolutely are not building tunnels to deal with that. I mean, you want to take more property? Go ahead. It's a house in a rural area, like, it's not actually worth that much. Um, are there any questions? Are there any, any more questions?
let's give it two more minutes and then stop if there aren't any more questions. It'll be a little more than two hours, seven. I won't say a little more than two hours, it's going to be exactly two hours, 17, two hours, 18 of recording, maybe what I meant is it was a little more than 215. A little more than 215, and then I gave it already more than a number. Wait, I don't even need to guess this is exact. Will it maybe cut this at 215? Um, anyway, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope this is a good explanation for our, like the kind of interface between weird politics and uh, the resistance of the, uh, and, and German resistance to the high speed rail revolution. Um, so thanks for watching. Um, you're very welcome for the thanks. Um, thanks for having to us. And uh, I will upload this because it's topical for the election. Um, it's actually pretty, I, I, again, as I said, I'm very happy voting green for the Bundestag. Um, I'm unhappy with my jersey vote green. In, like, like in the city, like for the Alberta House, I was sure for a while I would vote for SPD and then eventually the SPD racism got to me. Um, and, and their unwillingness to throw diet the city. Um, so um, I will upload this. Thanks for watching. Um, and uh, I will see you in a week, um, in a week with another video. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, take care.